Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Good to be in the house of the Lord today. Yes. Tell your neighbor Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Man, what a great service we've had so far, right? Yeah. 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 So without further ado, we have a double portion of Achrimot and Kedushim. Here's a picture of me having Arab Shabbat in Israel. I did this on, on, on behalf of Karen, who just came back from the land of Israel. Her and Joel just came back, so let's give it up for them. Having made Aliyah to the, to the promised land. And this message that I have today is called Shabbat Sets Us Apart. Say that again. Shabbat, Shabbat, Shabbat Sets, sets us, apart. us Apart. This uh, portion today comes from Vayikra, or Leviticus 16, 1 through 20, 27. Amotz or Amos 9, 7 through 15, and we had Kepha Aleph, 1 Peter 1, 13 through 21. We say a hearty Baruchim Abayim for all of our welcome guests. Welcome. And uh, this week we will start with Leviticus 16, 1. As it says in the complete Jewish Bible, Adonai spoke to Moshe after the death. Or in Hebrew, Achremot. Can you say Achremot? Of Aharon's two sons when they tried to sacrifice before Adonai and what? Die. How sad that they died, but we, we know that there's always life after the death. Amen? Amen. Leviticus 16.2 says, Adonai said to Moshe, Tell your brother Aharon not to come just at any time in the holy place beyond the curtain, the parochet, as it said in Hebrew, in front of the ark cover, or you know it as the mercy seat. And it says, which is on the ark, so that you will not what? Die. Die. So after the death of two sons, we need to avoid having death again. <clears throat> they cannot go into the Holy of Holies at any time. Because I appear in the cloud over the ark cover. Verse 3 goes on to say, here is how Aharon is to enter the holy place. Say enter. Yeah. Enter. Enter the holy place with a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering. So now, I want you to get an illustration in your head. <clears throat> I want you to think of the three rooms of the tabernacle. Today there's three rooms, just like three rooms of the temple. The first room of the tabernacle was the outer court. court. Say it again, the outer, outer court. court. The second room is the what? Inner the inner holy court. place, or there's the inner court made with the holy place. And third, there is the Holy of Holies. So just like there are three rooms, I want you to think about Egypt, the wilderness, and the promised land. So if you're in Egypt, you're still in the outer court. You're still waiting to bring a sacrifice to the gate. You're on the outside trying to get in. And so there is a process of becoming a priest unto God. God told Israel, when you go in the wilderness, at Sinai, he told them you'd be kings and priests. Only in the holy place can the priest enter. So therefore, the second room to enter into the holy place is becoming a true believer in that sense of being a king and a priest unto God. So even though that place is a dark room without light, you have the ability to put oil and lamps and light up that dark place. How many know we should never curse the darkness, but we should shine the light, which is the light of the word of God, into the dark place? Whatever it is, a dark place of bondage, a dark place of unforgiveness, a dark place of sickness and disease, we should shine the light of what God says in his word about it instead of cursing the darkness. And so the final room, which is the final or third room of the inner court, is called the what? Holy, holy of Holies. Notice the outer court is one level of holiness. The holy place is a second level of holiness. But the Holy of Holies is the third level of holiness, as it's called, Holy of Holies. Kodesh HaKodeshim. So it's three levels of holiness, the third room being the third level. What do the angels in heaven cry out? Holy, holy, holy. 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 Say it in Hebrew. Kadosh. Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. So from the outer court, there's a level of holiness and sanctification of the blood. In the holy place, there's another level of sanctification of the blood sprinkled. And then when you finally get to the Holy of Holies, they sprinkle the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, and there's the third dimension of what the blood can do. Oh, I don't think you heard me today. There's a third dimension of what the blood can do. It's not good enough to know that the blood brought you out. It's another thing to know that the blood is there to bring you in. And when the blood was on the doorpost, it kept the death angel out and allowed the Israelite to go in. See, we've come out of stuff, but have we come into what the blood has paid for? We need to know the blood of the Lamb is not just for deliverance, 
The blood of the Lamb is for the possession of the promised land yes. right. to go into the door. Every door frame has the blood of the Lamb. Just like now we have the mezuzah, the door frame little case holder for the scroll that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. It goes on to tell us we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and strength. So what I want you to see is, just like the wilderness was a process to get into the promised land, so the holy place was a process of sanctification to get into the holy holies. So the priesthood were allowed into the holy place, but only the high priest could go into the Kodesh Kodeshim, and that is the holy holies. So if you take a look at the connection between our first portion, which is Achimot, to our second approach, a portion which is from Leviticus 19, 1 to 20, 27. It is called Kedoshim. Can you say Kedoshim? Kedoshim. Kedoshim means holy ones. What does God call us? Holy ones. Holy ones. Kedoshim. It actually can be translated, be holy. Be holy as he is holy. So it goes on to say in Leviticus 19, 1, Adonai said to Moshe, speak to the entire community of Israel and tell them. Read it with me. You people are to be holy. In Hebrew, it's Kedoshim. Because I am, or because I, Adonai your God, am what? Holy. Every one of you is to revere his father and mother, and you are to keep my Shabbats. I am Adonai your God. So honoring your father and your mother will teach you about holiness. But also keeping the Sabbath teaches you about holiness. What the rabbis have said, it's not so much that Israel's always kept the Sabbath, but the Sabbath has always been keeping Israel. Right. Because it keeps you in a reminder that I am the Lord your God that brought you out. Amen. Therefore, in Egypt, you didn't rest. You worked seven days a week. Right. But now that you're mine, I'm going to give you a day to re refresh, to renew, to restore yourself. Because if you work seven days a week, that's called slavery. Right. Mm -hmm. But the priests, they would work towards a goal of entering into the presence of God, the rest of the holy place, the holy post. It wasn't work for them. The rabbis say that even carrying the Ark of the Covenant, God was carrying them with the Ark, literally levitating that Ark up in the air like it was easy. Yeshua says, my burden is what? Light. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. So when you think about Kedoshim being holy, this is a hard thing to live up to because when you and I think holy, we think perfect. Right? Because right? God's perfect. God was actually not speaking of his perfection, although he is perfect. Right. God was speaking of his set-apartness. Right. That he is different from the gods of Egypt. That he is not an idol that you can make with your hands. Right. Fashioned after man or sky, heavens above or earth beneath or the sea. We cannot fashion something that we create and worship it and call it God. Because how many know that's not a God, that's an idol? Right. So if you take a look at the original commandment in Genesis 2.1, most of you know this, we, we say these words on the evening of the Sabbath. Bereshit or Genesis 2 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were what? Finished. Finished. How funny. Man makes gods out of the heavens. Man makes gods out of the things of the earth. Man makes gods out of the hosts of heaven. God says, I created all of them. Therefore, that's not what you worship. You worship me who created them. Right. Not the creation, but the creator. How do we learn this? He says, Well, and on the seventh day, God ended his work, which, uh, which he had done, and he what? He rested on the seventh day from all of his what? Work. His work. That means we should try to get our work done in six days so we can have some what? Rest. Some rest. And if we don't, guess what? We will find ourselves needing to get that rest anyway. But the next week won't give it to us either because we're still working. Our... New Covenant read today from the Brit HaRashah was 1 Peter 1 uh, and uh, we have a couple verses starting from verse 13. I'm going to back up to verse 1. As it says in 1 Peter 1, 1, Peter, an emissary of Messiah Yeshua to the sojourners, really foreigners of the diaspora in Pontus, in Galatia. How about the book of Galatians? Those are Jews scattered to Galatia. Cappadocia, Jews were also scattered to Asia and Bithynia. Do you know we actually know who the, the scattered Jews of Asia are? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're called the tribe of Manasseh. They're in Israel today and they look Asian. 
Mm. Guess what? There's also Ethiopian Jews in Israel, and they're recognized as of Jews that came from the lineage of King Solomon, probably from the Queen of Sheba. Guess what? They're there. And you've got Jews from Russia and Poland. You've got Cuban and Puerto Rican Jews. You've got Spanish Jews. You've got Mexican Jews. Guess what? You've got Jews from Ecuador. You've got Jews from Peru. You've got Jews from the Isle of, uh, of the Sea. You've got Caribbean Jews. You've got, you've got uh, Jews in North America and South America, Australia, New Zealand. There are Jews all over the world. God scattered them on purpose. How else do you think the nations were going to ever know him? Because only one nation accepted his Torah. So he has to take that Torah to Italia. Yes, he does. And so we have the Italkin. My last name is Belechi. Guess what? It goes back to Sicily, which was a Jewish quarters, especially in Messina especially in Trapani and Palermo. And those areas of Sicily, like many parts of, of, of northern and southern Italy, had plenty of Jews, and there are ruins to this day of the synagogues. Some of them were turned into Catholic churches. Some of them were turned in other, into other things, but the remnants are there because you can't get rid of the Jewish people. Right. You try to bury them, they resurrect. They tried that with a young jo Jewish boy from Nazareth. You know what happened to him. He resurrected. I don't know if that was a good investment or not, but... So, when you think about it, uh, these Jews from all over, they are chosen. Somebody say chosen. chosen. The Jews are the chosen people. How do we know they're Jews being spoken of here? Peter was not necessarily called to Gentiles. No. Peter was called to the Jews. Right. The scattered Jews that are in all of these areas. Since the days of Babylon, and even the Roman Empire scattered the Jewish people in what we call the diaspora or the dispersion. Do the history, Google it. Uh, verse number two says, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Watch this. This version says, set apart by the Ruach. Your version might say, through the sanctification of the Spirit. How many have sanctification there? Yeah. All right, some of you have sanctification. The word sanctification is the word set apart or to make holy. So notice that the sanctification of the Jewish people was done by the Spirit for obedience. So the Spirit never comes for disobedience. Right. The Spirit comes to help us be obedient. Right. How many are going to be obedient today from the Spirit of God speaking to you today? Yes. Amen? And may He continue to speak in this message. Look, it says, And for the sprinkling of the blood, how amazing. Yes. You bring your animal in obedience. The priest takes it, slaughters it, takes the blood, and sprinkles for you. So Israel becomes sanctified by the offering of the people. You bring it. You bring your offering in obedience. He'll take the blood and sanctify you with it. You bring the lamb, we'll have Passover, right? You bring the fruit of the lamb, we'll have tabernacles, Sukkot, right? You bring the Torah, we'll have Shavuot, right? And we'll also have Simchat Torah. But guess what? If you don't bring it in obedience, God can't do his part if you don't do yours. Amen. So part of sanctification is learning to be obedient to what God's told you through the sprinkling of the blood, not just of a lamb, but look what it says. Of Yeshua the Messiah. May grace and shalom be multiplied to you. Amen. Now let's go to our Brit HaShah reading, verse 13 of the same chapter. Therefore get your minds ready for work. Come on, everybody, put your work clothes on. Keep yourselves under control. Come on, somebody say, control that old flesh. Control. Come on, get yourselves under control. Fix your hope fully on the gift you will receive when Yeshua the Messiah is revealed. Meaning, if you're obedient, you will be rewarded for your obedience because Yeshua is coming back to reward his sheep, not his goats. Amen. He's coming for a reward for the wheat, not the tares. He's going to separate those two categories. Blessing comes from, for, from obedience. Cursing comes from disobedience. How I many know God can only bless obedience? If I bless my daughter's disobedience, I'm teaching her disobedience is okay. Right. So guess what? She's going to be seven in July. I've got to make sure she doesn't go into the next year thinking that what she did last year was okay when I try to correct her from that. Guess what? I'm not going to reward disobedience. Right. She gets yogurt land when she gets an A or a good dojo that shows up on my iPad. Let me tell you, when I see some good obedience, she's listening to the teacher, she's in line, she's obeying, and her teacher look, get, looks at me with a smile when I pick her up, guess what? I know she gets a reward. We're going straight to yogurt land. <laughs> we just did it Thursday. Trust me, I don't have a problem rewarding her and rewarding me. <laughs> God has no problem either. Look at verse number 15. I love this. On the contrary, but no, no, I didn't finish. 14. 14. As people who what? Obey God. Wait a minute. 
Beginning of the chapter says the sprinkling of the blood is for what? Obedience. Now he says, act like people that obey God. I mean, at least act like it. You know, we, we, we sometimes we put on this show that, oh, I'm, I'm a believer, I serve the Lord, and, but we need to act like it. We need to act like, at least pretend to obey God, because maybe it will stick after a while if you at least pretend. But I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that are evidently being disobedient, and they just have boldness about being disobedient. Well, I don't have to listen to that. Well, you don't need to tell me what to do, and I'm not going to listen to you. We need to get rid of that rebellious spirit. Because God only blesses and sanctifies the obedient. He doesn't want to disobedient children. Even with grace. Grace doesn't come to allow you to do what you've been wanting to do anyway. Grace empowers you to do what you couldn't do when you were having a hard time being obedient to God and you kept sinning. Grace is to get you out of that sin, not to keep you in it. You know what the people do with grace? They say, oh, well, we're in the new covenant now. We have grace. Give it to that Old Testament law. So you think Yeshua came to die for you to be disobedient. No. Yeshua came to empower you by His Spirit to start obeying what you couldn't do in your physical flesh. Because the Spirit is there to help you do it. That's why He's called the Helper. Right. So grace shouldn't make me actually go backwards in my faith. It should press me forward. Right. It should sanctify me and set me apart to be different from everybody else. If I'm cussing like everybody else, I mean, no, that's not sanctification. Right. If I'm laughing at every dirty joke I hear in my job workplace, guess what? That's not sanctification. If you're hearing gossip, just walk away. Don't even give it another minute. You want a real way to test if a person's gossiping or they're just repeating bad information? Say, hey, can we just stop and pray right now? The person that just repeats bad information, they'll actually go, oh, you're right. We really shouldn't be talking about this. We should pray about it. I'm so glad you said that, sister. I'm so glad you said that, brother. Pray about it. The person that says, oh, no, I, I, I've already been praying about it. Well, or I'm getting mad. Well, what are you trying to say? Or They get upset. They've shown their true colors. Because a real believer will pray even when they made a mistake. Let's see what it says uh, in verse 15. It says, On the contrary, following the Holy One who called you, become holy yourselves in your entire way of life. Does that leave anything out? Nope. That almost sounds like it's going even beyond the Torah. I mean, the Torah told us to be holy, but it said in your entire way of life. In other words, if the Torah didn't enumerate something, if there was something left out of the black on my pages, yeah. guess what? Add to it. Right. Now, not really add or take away, but expand your idea of it. Because how many know technology has changed since Moses? Right. So we got to include, you know, at rest. Sometimes we need to say, you know, I'm going to rest from the Facebook. I'm going to get my face in the book. Right? 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 right. right. Thank you. I'm going to stop tumbling with Tumblr and start walking by faith. Right. I'm going to stop Instagramming and I'm going to write a journal about my devotion today. That's what I'm going to do, Instagram. Really? We're, we're, we're saying less in our social media than what we could do face to face. Because yeah. I can't even, I don't even know your intention on a text. Right. I don't even know what you really meant by that post. And I'm sure wondering why you put that picture on Facebook. Right. You know that one that was angry and mad, and, and then you see a person you know is a believer that are cussing on Facebook. Huh. I get disgusted right. to know that I just wasted my time to see someone's nasty, dirty, foul post on Facebook when they used to use that to expand and preach and teach and share the testimony of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And two seconds later, they get angry, and they put everything on their face in the book. Right. And then it shows up in my Facebook wall. I, I might have to remove you from a friend. Yeah. Yeah. I might have to remove your post. Guess what? You might think you can post stuff on my wall. I choose who can post and who can't post. Yeah. So it's got to come in an acceptance for me. And if it doesn't match what I'm called to do, if it doesn't match my calling, I, even if it's a quote-unquote Christian post, I will remove it. Because I don't want misinformation on my wall when people say, hey, Rabbi has a Facebook. I know he uses it for to preach the gospel and share the good news, especially if they break roots of the faith. And then they go to my wall and some crazy, confusing, weird jargon from replacement theology shows up on my wall. Remove it. In fact, it doesn't get accepted. Delete. Don't you wish you could delete the gossip from your life? Yeah. Amen. Delete the naysayers, delete the doubt and confusion. We need to be holy in all of our entire way of life. Amen? Amen. Now, if we take a look at um, verse 17, it says, Also, if you're at 
addressing as father the one who judges impartially according to each person's actions, you should live out your temporary state on earth in fear or in reverence. How funny. In the New Covenant, we revel in the fact that we call God Father, but God's still the judge. Treat the Father like he's going to judge your actions. How many know that even though I love my daughter with my yoga land, guess what? I can judge her actions and say, you know what? I'm sorry, I'm not taking you to yoga land. Guess what? You didn't clean your room, so I'm not going to reward that. Until you clean your room, you, didn't, you don't get to go to the park and play. Guess what she does? She's picking up every Barbie she can find. <laughs> All those clothes are in those little drawers because she wants to go to the park. We want the rewards, but we don't want the obedience. That's right. I'm preaching myself just like I'm preaching you. So you might as well say amen or oh me. Amen. Now, look at verse 18. I love it. Verse 18 says, You should be aware that the ransom paid to free you from the worthless way of life which your fathers passed on to you did not consist of anything perishable like silver and gold. Do you understand you should be aware of how much Yeshua paid the price for you? Are you going to waste the life that he paid the price to free by going back to bondage? I don't want to waste another drop of Yeshua's blood. I don't want to waste a moment that he stayed on that cross until it got dark, until the, the veil was rent for me. I don't want to waste another minute. That blood cost too much. Amen? Amen. The priceless blood of Messiah. Look at uh, the price in verse 19. And on the contrary, it was the costly, bloody, sacrificial death of Messiah as a lamb without defect or spot. Look at verse 21. Through him you trust in God, and who raised him from the dead, gave him glory, so that your trust and hope are in God. Who's your trust and hope in? God. God. So look at Hebrews 4.4. 4. Talking about trust and hope. For there is a place where it's said concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the what? Seventh day. Seventh day from all his words. And once more our pretext says, they will not enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter it, just like you enter in the holy place, just like you enter the promised land, it says there will still remains for some to enter it, and those who received the word, the good news, earlier did not enter. Before we read any further, let's take a, the word, look, take a look at the word Shabbat. Mm -hmm. The word Shabbat, Shin, Beit, Tav, right. also give us in the infinitive form, Lamed, Shin, Beit, Tav, which is Leshevet, which means to sit or rest. So Shabbat means that God was up and working for six days, and then he sat down and rested in the throne of his glory as creator over his creation. When you keep the Sabbath, you're remembering that God is the creator, not you. So you refrain from creative activity so that you can recreate or be recreated back in his image. So you can refresh, renew, regenerate, Revive, restore what's been sometimes broken down all week long. How many know you need your rest? Amen. I said, how many know you need your rest? Yes. In fact, it's seen in the ten words of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20 verse 4 gives us the fourth commandment, letter Dalit. Remember the day, Shabbat, to set it apart for God. Set it apart as holy. It's not in your notes, but it's on the screen today. Look, look ahead. You have six days to labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Shabbat for Adonai your God. Jump down for, to verse 11. For in six days Adonai made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, but on the seventh day he rested. This is why Adonai blessed the day Shabbat and separated it from himself, for himself. So separated means sanctified, set apart. God set apart the Shabbat so that you could be set apart. And if you keep it, you'll be different from everybody else. Everyone else will keep on working. You're going to rest. Everyone else will keep on sowing their seed in the seventh year. You're going to let the land lay fallow or rest. And therefore, when the land rests, it rejuvenates the minerals into the soil. You know what's wrong with our food? The tomatoes are green before they get gassed in the grocery store's back room. They're green harvested because we've got to overwork the soil till there's no minerals left in the soil. Israel was told, you want supernatural rejuvenation? Let it rest, and I'll rejuvenate it, so that your sixth year produces three times as much, so that you can rest the seventh, you won't sow again to the eighth, you won't reap it to the ninth, so you need three years of harvest. Right. And every cycle of seven will lead to seven times seven to 49 years of jubilee 
will set the captive free and release the land even when it gets sold into bondage. I want the land free like I want the man free, like I want the people free. Blessed is the land, blessed is the man who puts their trust in the Lord. Amen. So Hebrews chapter 4 verse 7, we pick up and it says, he again fixes a certain day. Say today. 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 In Hebrew that's Hayom, which means the day. Not a day of Sabbath, the day of the Sabbath. So literally it says today, but it means the day. Saying this day, literally. Saying through David, so long afterwards, in the text already, today if you hear my voice, don't harden your hearts. For if Yahushua or Joshua had given them what? Rest, meaning when they entered the promised land, God would not have spoken later of another day. Meaning today if you'll hear my voice. So God is using the Sabbath day as a picture of the day when you rest from your sins. So think about this. When you rest in your sins, your day becomes today. Today, if you'll hear my voice, today is the day of salvation. Right? This is the day that the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad. Now, uh, take a look at verse 9. So there remains a Shabbat keeping. In, in Hebrew, it's called a Shabbaton. In the Greek, it's Sabbaton, which means a Sabbath rest. Some versions just put a rest. But they've lied to you. Yeah. Say it. They have lied to you. Yeah. The Greek says a sabbaton. Look it up in any dictionary. It says it's the rest of the Sabbath day kept by Israel in the wilderness and in the promised land. It is not a day of rest. It's the Sabbath day. It's a set day. You can't change God's calendar. Right? right? It says there still remains a sabbaton or a Sabbath rest or a Sabbath keeping for God's people. For the one who has entered God's rest has also rested from his own works. As God did from his, therefore let us do our best to enter that what? Rest. rest. So that no one will fall short because of the same kind of disobedience. What gets you sanctified? Obedience. What gets you unsanctified? Disobedience. And so trusting God is obedience. In fact, if you don't obey, it's because you don't trust him. Well, I can't pay my tithes. Well, don't you trust him? Well, no, I can't, I can't go to the house of the Lord today because i got stuff to do on Saturday. Well, don't you trust him? Well, you don't understand I mow the lawn on Saturdays. You can't find any other time of the week during Shabbat time to mow the lawn. In fact, it's too hot right now to mow the lawn. Why would you even want to mow it? Why don't you want to sit in an air-conditioned building and, and observe Shabbat with your brother and your sister? Amen. It's the best place to be on the planet. It's like Disneyland. <laughs> Best place on earth. Come on. Turn to the back of your notes. Let me show you a, a, def, a definition of holiness from the online source of the Jewish Virtual Library. .com. It says, the biblical term for holiness is Kodesh. And this is a, an entry on the word Kedusha or Kedusha. The Mishnaic Hebrew term Kedusha and that which is regarded as holy is called Kadosh. Jewish exegetes, meaning people that break down the meaning of scripture, following early rabbinical interpretation, like scholars like Sifra, of Leviticus on verse, chapter 19, verse 2, record, you shall be holy for the Lord your God am holy, having consistently taken the verb Kadesh to mean distinguished or set apart. It goes on to say, Seeking to express the infallible holiness of God, an ultimate category, the biblical authors drew on a vast and varied series of predicates. With the single exception of God's moral perfection and action, they all fall within the scope of this mysterium tremendum, meaning something that's mysterious and tremendous in Latin. The most frequent is fearsome or awesome. The Hebrew word is norah as found in passages of the Psalms like 89.7 and verse 8, 99.3, and Psalms 111, verse 9. A side of which a theophany and a manifestation of God has been experienced is described as awesome as in, and induces in the uh, visioner a state of fear or awesomeness as in Genesis 28.17. Who said awesome is this place? Jacob. Remember Jacob's ladder? He goes on to say, 
like I said, we lost. I feel like I lost a section here. Oh, no, that, that, here we go. He goes on to say, God's works are fearful. Say fearful. fearful. Exodus 15, 11, 34, 10, Psalm 66, 3, and verse 5 are referenced to his God's fearful or awesome works. This aspect of the divine holiness and man's attitude toward it are perhaps best summed up in the verse of 1 Samuel 6, 20. Who is able to stand before the Lord, the holy God? In several passages, like in Joshua 24, 19, God's fearful and unapproachable holiness is equated with his jealousy, his unrelenting demand for exclusive virtue. The fearful aspect of the divine holiness is reflected in the warning to keep one's distance from the outward manifestation of the divine presence. To gaze directly upon the divine manifestation or even upon it, the sacred vessels, when the latter are not in actual use, may cause death. God is glorious in holiness. His holiness is unique. His way is that of holiness. Preeminently, it is the divine name which is characterized as holy, since the name of God expresses his essence. Remember, we talked about that in the reading of the Torah today. Noteworthy is Ezekiel's repeated use of the phrase, my name, my holy name. To Isaiah, we owe the appellation of God as the Holy One of Israel. The term is employed even more consistently. It appears once in Jeremiah 50, 29, and in Psalm 71, 22. Isaiah's tendency to characterize God as the Holy One of Israel may be assumed to derive from the divine call to the prophet in Isaiah chapter 6, in which he hears the dramatic thrice repeated proclamation of the seraphim. Holy, 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 the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. In this encounter, in the presence of the absolute holiness of God, the apparent in intention of the dramatic repetition, literally three times, the prophet is overcome by an acute sense of his own sinfulness and that of the people among whom he dwells. The passage clearly implies and indeed, indeed emphasizes the moral aspect of God's holiness. However, it is erroneous to assert that, as is frequently done, that the interpretation of the divine holiness as essentially an expression of God's moral perfection is the unique contribution of the prophets. Distinctly priest, priestly writers associate God's holiness with moral qualities. This is to be seen in the so-called holiness code of Leviticus 17 through 26. In priestly law, like Leviticus 19, which is our reading today, the purely ritualistic aspects of holiness are combined with distinctly moral injunctions. Priestly liturgy, as found in Psalms 15 and 24, 3 through 6, stresses that only he who has clean hands and a pure heart can stand on God's holy mountain, as in Psalms 24, 3 and 4. The prophets deepen and broaden the moral dimension of the divine holiness. Now, before we look at this definition, what I want you to realize, say God is holy. God is holy. Say God is holy to the third dimension. God is holy to the third dimension. Now this is the amazing thing. Holiness doesn't start and stop with God. God put a ladder before Jacob. Angels were ascending and descending upon him, showing that there are levels to ascend in God. We're supposed to be coming up higher because his thoughts are higher. His ways are higher. We shouldn't be doing the same as we've done last year. We should come up higher this year. We shouldn't think the kind of thoughts we thought last year. We should come higher in our thinking. And so if we're not ascending in holiness, then God's not really holy. Because God said, be holy as I am holy. So God sees himself at the top of the ladder and Jacob at the bottom. Do you think Jacob was at his full state of holiness at the bottom? No. Jacob was still a bit of a deceiver, wasn't he? But he wrestled with his flesh as he wrestled with the angel and his hip was thrown out of socket and he finally realized that he is now not supposed to just be only Jacob. He's supposed to act like a prince of God, Israel, meaning there's something higher to attain. We can't put all the work on God. Well, God's holy and I can't live like Messiah because he was perfect. No, no, no. Be you holy as I am holy. 
come up in your ways. I gave you Shabbat to teach you about my holiness. I gave you a time to come together on Shabbat so you can learn about my holiness. And when you walk away, you should be holier than you are right now. Holiness, holiness is not perfection. Holiness is living a set-apart life. If we don't walk away different and change from this message, the question is, when did we come? Something should literally transform us from the moment we hear the sound of the shofar to the closing benediction and the last cup of blessing when we walk out of here rejoicing that we've been bringing in the sheaves. We will go rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. If we didn't have a feast day for Shabbat to celebrate, then why come if we didn't learn anything, if we didn't grow, if we didn't change, if God didn't prick our heart, if God is not changing us and shaping us and molding us into the best he wants us to, be, us to be, how can we be sanctified? How can we be holy as he is holy? You see, in various ways, holiness is to consecrate, to sanctify, set apart, de dedicate, be hollowed, be holy, be sanctified or set apart, to show oneself sacred and majestic, to be honored, to set apart as sacred, consecrate, dedicate, in all the various forms and conjugations of Hebrew. It, it means even in the Hitpael form, in the last one, to keep oneself apart or separate. So holiness is not just something God does for you. It's something you do for you. I got one shaking the head and one, yeah. Amen. Holiness is not just something that Yeshua did for you. It's something that Yeshua is doing through you. Yes. And it's something you do for you Amen. and for your spouse and for your children, for your family. If you live holy, they will. If you don't, they won't. I don't know if that's a tweet, but that sure is a good quote. <laughs> you see, the name of God that we should focus on is Adonai. In one version, it's called Mekadeshim. The Lord who sanctifies and sets us apart as holy. Or as it says specifically in Leviticus 20, verse 8, Adonai Mekadeshem. The Lord who sanctifies you all. He sanctifies y'all. <laughs> Not just me, but y'all. Don't expect me to be holier than you. Or me to act holier than thou, as the Pharisees did. Because if I have to be holy, so do you. Right. Guess what? The beauty of it is, my daughter learns her holiness from her mom and dad. Right. Why do you think the, God, the Lord says, if you honor your father and your mother, that's one level of holiness you'll learn to keep. And I'll set you apart just from learning from your parents. Right. But if you keep Shabbat, then you get to learn from everybody else. Yep. Oh my goodness, you didn't catch that. Yes. All my life, my mother and my father have been teaching me to live a holy life. But when I get around other believers, I learn how to live and walk in the footsteps of other people that do it every Shabbat. Yes. And if I can do it here, then on Monday on my job, I can do it there. If I can do it here with my brothers and sisters, I can do it with my enemies. Amen. If I can do it with this family, I can do it with that Hellenite family that doesn't believe in God and is cursing God to my face. Yeah. If I can live holy as He is holy, then other people will desire to drink from the cup that I've been right. drinking. Yeah. Oh, let me give you that verse that says in Leviticus 20 verse 8 observe my regulations obey them I am the Lord who sets you apart to be holy Amen. this was given to Moses for the whole house of Israel to be set apart as a holy nation the Sabbath or Shabbat was a symbol of that set apartness to make whole to set apart for holiness or for a holy use from Kadosh or holy in Hebrew from the root Kadash, which means to be wholly set apart, consecrated, or sanctified. Leviticus 11.44 also speaks of it. I am the Lord your God. You shall be therefore, uh, shall therefore sanctify yourself. Wait a minute. God, you do it. No, no. Sanctify yourself. Hmm. You didn't catch that, did you? He yeah. says sanctify yourself, and you shall be holy. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. First you tell me to be holy. Now you tell me to do it myself? God, I can't make myself holy. Yes, you can. If I told you to do it, you can do it. Yeah. You can do all things through Messiah who strengthens you. If he gave you the word to do it, he'll give you the power to do it. Yeah. Through the Holy Spirit. To be your God, you shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. If you let me be your God, I'll be holy in you. Jeremiah 5, 1 says, Therefore I formed you in the womb, and I knew you before you were born. I sanctified you, and I ordained you as a prophet to the nation. Deuteronomy 7, 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be 
a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. You need to be different than everybody else. Yeah. And of course, our passage today was in 1 Peter 1.15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your what? Conduct. Conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Chapter 2, verse 9 continues that conversation. Your chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy, holy nation. nation. Quoting Exodus 19, verse 5. His own special people, that you may proclaim, proclaim the praises of him who was called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now you've obtained mercy. Amen. 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 Exodus 31, 13, speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a what? Sign. A sign between me and you, therefore your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, therefore, for it is holy to you. Amen. Amen. It's holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that person is to be cut off from among his people. Amen. So let's ask the question. What does sanctification mean to you? It means to be set apart. Why do you think God wanted his people to not work on the Sabbath? So they could be set apart. Do you have a Sabbath rest when you keep the Shabbat? Or do you argue and complain and bicker and get frustrated, get mad, and rush to the house of God, worrying about if you're going to get a speeding ticket? Yeah. <laughs> I question whether on our Shabbat we're really having Shabbat. Yeah. If we're not getting the rest out of Shabbat we were supposed to have. It would be better to do less on Shabbat than do more and actually have less rest. Yeah. The thing I want to also ask you is, how do you feel when you are resting? What is significant about that natural rest? And then the rest that Yeshua refers to in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. And third, what areas do you feel you need to be sanctified in? Your mind, does your mind need some rest? Your job, do you need rest from your enemies on your job? Your family, are there people fighting or situations in your family you can't overcome? You need some Shabbat rest. Your friends, are they really friends? If you can't have Shabbat with your friends, are they really friends at all? Right. Your friends should not be frustrating you. Your friends should be giving you rest, taking the burden off your shoulders, not adding to them. Right. You got a gossiper in your house, get rid of them. Amen. Now, if they're really in your house and your family, you can't get rid of them. You can't pick your family. But you can sure shut down their gossip. You know what? Turn the worship on, get a prayer meeting going, shut it down. Because we're going to pray in this house. It's for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. 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 Here's the words of Messiah. That's my close. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? Rest. Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find what? Rest, rest for your souls. What do you think Shabbat's about? It gives us rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If it's that hard, maybe it shouldn't be done anyway. If it takes that much work in the relationship, is the relationship really working at all? No. Why are we trying to think, make things work that God never put together? Amen. We're trying to make it fit, and God said that's a square peg in a round hole. <laughs> well, I'm trying to make them serve the Lord. You can't make anybody serve the Lord. Amen. I'm trying to make my kids be obedient. No, just be obedient yourself, and they'll learn how to be obedient. Because, see, somewhere along the way, they learn rebellion from you. Or friends, or family, or some outside influence. But check your house. Make sure there's real rest in your house. Because if you're fighting in front of your kids, and you're screaming in front of your kids, and you're arguing in front of your kids, and you're cussing in front of your kids, you want to know where they learn the cuss word? Yeah. From you, Daddy. Right. From you, Mommy. Guess what? The first time I ever said the S-T-U-P-I-D word, my daughter put a rebuke on me, slapped me silly. She goes, Daddy, you're not supposed to say that word. I said, I was like, what'd you say? <laughs> and all of a sudden I got rebuked because I said, oh, that's right. I'm the one that told her not to say that word. Right. So I can't do something that I don't want her to do too. Right. I can't take my liberty and do it in front of her and expect her not to do it. Monkey see, monkey do. Daddy do, daughter do. Right. 
Let me close. Now, if you were to go to Matthew 12, you'll see Yeshua talks about the Sabbath, but I'm going to actually read the Mark passage in Mark 2.27 because it adds something. Mark adds something to or reminds us of something Yeshua said. Then he said to them that were trying to rebuke him, saying he wasn't keeping the Sabbath. Yeshua said, Shabbat was made for mankind, not mankind for Shabbat. Man was made not for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. So the Son of Man, the Messiah, is Lord even of Shabbat. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. You see, until you have a revelation of Hashem and the body of Messiah, you will not understand sanctification from, from Hashem. Adonai is always going to desire to sanctify our lives, but it will not start until we have committed our lives. Sanctification is a process, but if you're faithful, Hashem will complete the work He has. How mm -hmm. I many know if He began it, He'll finish it? Yeah. Three things I want you to write down. Shabbat was set apart for all men. Once you get that revelation, you'll stop saying what's well, only for the Jews. No, no, no. Jews are the protector or guardians of it. But it was given to everybody in the garden. Mm -hmm. That's when the Shabbat rest came into existence. If you know that the Shabbat was set apart for mankind, then you understand that out of all mankind, Israel was set apart from all mankind as guardians of Shabbat. Yes. So when God gave Israel... A separation from the nations like Egypt, the first thing he told them to keep is keep the Shabbat. Shabbat will keep you. Keep you in my ways. Keep you in my heart. Keep you in my rest. So Shabbat was given to all mankind, but we also know that Israel was set apart from all mankind as a guardian or as a keeper of Shabbat. Shomer Shabbat. And then number three, most beautiful thing, is out of Israel. The very Messiah of Israel. As Lord of Shabbat was set apart for the sanctification of all mankind. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. From seven days, he took one. From 70 nations, he took one. And then from that nation, he took one. From the sons of Abraham, he took one. The seed of Abraham, Messiah. And if it wasn't for Messiah, you and I would un not understand perfect Shabbat time. Perfect Shabbat rest and perfect sanctification. Are you thankful for Yeshua? Because without him, we'd be lost. We'd still be wandering in Egypt. Today, we say Shabbat Shalom to all of you as you stand to your feet and believe God for Shavua Tov. Stretch your hands for the blessing. Did you receive from this message today? Yes. Thank you, Lord. Stretch your hands as we thank God for this Shabbat rest. Number 624 through 26 is the blessing you'll hear me say in the Hebrew tongue. And I'll say it in English. Let's close for service and benediction today. Ibarach Adonai v'yishmarecha Ya'er Adonai p'nav elecha v'yunecha Yisar Adonai p'nav elecha v'yasem lecha Shalom Amen May the Lord Adonai bless and keep you. May the Lord Adonai shine his face upon you and be gracious to you with divine favor. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you perfect peace. And Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, and Yeshua HaMashiach, the Anointed Messiah. In his name we pray, B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. And I'm ready to sing it already. May the Lord bless you and keep you And make His face to shine upon you And be gracious to you May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you May the Lord grant you His peace May the Lord bless you and keep you And make His face to shine upon you And be gracious to you May the Lord lift up
lift up his countenance upon you May the Lord grant you his peace Adonai Adonai 